how far do you think the Reserve Bank of India will raise rates and when? Well, you know, they've, they've been uh, more, more consistent in raising rates than um, uh, the People's Bank of China. And I, I'd say they've got another two to three hundred basis points, two to three uh, percentage points to go uh, to, to really get interest rates at a level that uh, will slow growth and contain inflation. And do you think that they'll get there, or do you think that, once again, like China, they won't raise rates as fast as markets wish they would? Well, you know, developing economies are afraid of growth accidents, so they always want to walk this fine line between um, uh, a monetary tightening uh, and uh, the need to underwrite economic growth. And so they're, they're, they're wary to take a hit uh, on, on growth. India likes strong growth. China likes strong growth. But... There are consequences of, of being too uh, supportive of growth, and inflation What's the danger? is one. What's the danger for India if it doesn't tighten enough? Inflation. Inflation is devastating, for, uh, whether it's food inflation or non-food inflation. They're all on the rise in India, and that undermines the emerging prosperity of a, you know, of a nascent middle class. Even the government's legitimacy in some cases. Sure. Inflation is a very cruel tax, especially for a developing economy with such a huge population of poor people. So you're worried that even as inflation remains high, growth could slow? Well, it certainly could. And, and uh, if inflation remains high, it'll eat into the purchasing power of this newly emerging uh, middle class. And, and uh, that's a breeding ground for social instability. Uh, you know, we're seeing that in North Africa, uh, in the Middle East, and you don't want to see that in the growth miracles of Asia. Mm -hmm. um, where do you expect to see Indian GDP growth this year and also China? I think, uh, you know, we're talking high single-digit growth rates for both India and China, somewhere in the, you know, 8 to 9 percent area. China most likely will even be higher than that. Uh, India could be a little bit below that uh, if, if interest rates succeed in cooling off the economy. But these are rapidly growing economies. Um, India is, um, you know, always had a good... Uh, micro story in terms of its companies and its workforce and its market-based institutions. Uh, but the macro uh, story has, has lagged, especially China, and it's now getting better in terms of saving foreign direct investment infrastructure. So it's a good combination for India, and I think um, uh, India is capable, if they can deal with inflation, of sustaining 7, 8, maybe even 9 percent growth for a while. So India has to watch the onions, and then it may have a pretty smooth path. Yeah, yeah. Fair point. The global economies had several black swan events, the earthquake and tsunami in Japan, the unrest in North Africa and the Mideast, and of course, um, just further European debt worries. Are you worried about a, a perfect storm? I'm worried about a global economy that just doesn't have a cushion to be able to withstand such a large collection of shocks. Post-crisis global economies are weak. This one is not an exception. So. Uh, if, you, if you get this broad array of shocks like we have right now, uh, I think the, the possibility of a shortfall in global growth is, uh, is pretty high. Are you worried about a double dip? I'm always worried about a double dip. Uh, you're always a bear. Uh, I'm, I think in, in the last you know, 10 years, it's sort of paid to be on the cautious side. Well, that's true. Okay, so tell I, me I, one I, thing I you're a bull that. about. One I'm thing. a bull on China. I mean, I've been, I've been a bull on China for 15 years. I still am. That's why I love this region. All right. And you were just in Beijing talking to Wen Jiabao. What did you hear about China's approach to the economy? Well, this is a, a, a pivotal point in, in China's history. They've done the production economy extraordinarily well for 30 years, and now they've got a shift to the consumption economy. And so we talked uh, at these uh, meetings I was engaged in in Beijing over the last uh, uh, week about the 12th five-year plan and what it does to facilitate this change. Uh, and it's a very exciting uh, strategy, but as always, you know, the devil will be in the details and in the implementation tactics that will need to be uh, put in place to make this plan work. How about fighting inflation? How con concerned was Beijing about inflation right now? Well, they talk the talk, but the, the bottom line is um, uh, they, the uh, policies they've taken to deal with inflation uh, have been skewed toward the old central planning administrative measures, whether they're bank reserve requirements on the quantity of credit, debottlenecking agricultural supply. They've been very reluctant to use classic uh, stabilization policies like the currency or even uh, higher interest rates. And my advice to them was 
tighten up on monetary policy. If you don't want to move on the currency, you've got to move much more aggressively on interest rates. Where, where do you expect to see the renminbi at the end of the year? I think the renminbi is on a path of roughly 5% appreciation vis-a-vis -vis the dollar a year. And, you know, I, I, we've, you know we, we've done maybe one percentage point of that this year, uh, you know, in, in the first two and a half months of the year. And I, I think you've got more to come. This is a gradual process in China. China is not going to do what Japan did uh, uh, in the Plaza Accord, which is a big, uh, big mistake for Japan, a large one-off revaluation of the yen. How about inflation, uh, fighting inflation with interest rate increases? When will China next increase interest rates and by how much? I have no idea, but I think, uh, you know, the short-term uh, benchmark lending rate for a one-year maturity is 6%. The headline inflation rate is 5 so the inflation-adjusted or real interest rate is only 1%. That's, that's accommodative. Uh, that that, that uh, figure needs to be uh, 2%, 3%. And, and so there's a lot more to come on the interest rate uh, front in, in China. They've hiked rates three times in four and a half months, but uh, rates are still too low. So they'll be hiking later this year? I think they'll be hiking sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and how by the end of the year, where would you expect to see China's interest rates? I would hope they would be at least one percentage point uh, on the lending side above where they are right now. I'd prefer to see them two percentage points above, but I think that's probably too aggressive uh, a move for the Chinese authorities. Do you sense a mood change in China? There are quite a lot of changes there coming along with this new five-year plan. And just, re just this week, Beijing banned billboards of luxury goods. You've seen quite a number of tightening up on Western companies, particularly Internet companies. What's going on there? Well, you know, there, there are obviously a lot of disturbances going on around the world right now that, are, uh, that have been exacerbated by uh, social the combination of social tensions, income inequalities, uh, and uh, IT-enabled social networking. And I think the, the government uh, is always very concerned about uh, sources of social uh, instability. With a consumer society comes more of a, uh, an aspirational value proposition. Uh, and, and this will be challenging uh, for the Chinese government uh, to Im implement. But I honestly don't see uh, that they have any choice here. And so they're going to have to uh, move ahead and uh, be mindful of those risks at the same time. Do you think how much of the changes in China's economic policy were determined by the global financial crisis? Did, did China look at the export dependency it has before the crisis and get worried about its ability to grow its own economy? without domestic spending? You know, I, I think the die was cast long before the crisis. It was f literally four years ago this month when Premier Wen Jiabao said, you know, our economy in China looks strong on the surface, but beneath the surface, it's increasingly uh, unstable, unbalanced, uncoordinated, and ultimately unsustainable. The crisis made that view more correct than ever and has now accelerated the response to the Premier's critique. But they, they knew this model had to be changed. Who's going to rebalance the, their economy faster, China or the United States? China, China does everything quicker uh, than, than anybody else. And, and um, you know, the U.S., there's really no clear uh, sign that America is going to address its, its uh, savings deficits uh, for uh, individuals and especially uh, the government. So, you know, what you may get out of this, Robin, is what I've called an asymmetrical rebalancing scenario where the, the surplus economy China moves more aggressively than the deficit economy America with serious consequences for the dollar uh, and long-term interest rates because America is going to have to pay more to secure uh, a surplus savings from someone else. Right. The dollar has been rising in recent weeks, but, but it can't rise forever. In fact, it's... The dollar has been on downtrend for um, nine years. Uh, and in that secular downtrend, there are periodic... Um, episodes when it goes, you know, it does a counter trend rally. And, and you know, it, with these, these problems uh, in um, the Middle East, Libya, and now we've got another problem in Europe, you know, the dollar will bounce. But the, the main trend for a saving short nation with a massive trade and current account deficit is for a weaker currency. And the dollar on a broad basis against all the major currencies we trade with is down 25 percent from February 2002. Mm -hmm. And the pressure on Europe must be immense as the renminbi sinks almost in tandem with the dollar. Well, uh, the, the, the currency-related pressures on Europe are um, certainly part of the equation. But the, the big story is the sovereign debt issue and these uh, burgeoning uh, public sector deficits and then the unwillingness of 
of, of, of the body politic in Europe to really follow through on the fiscal austerity measures that are required to get these debt problems under control. You know, we've seen this earlier in the year, last year in Greece, and we're seeing it overnight in, in Portugal again. Europe knows it's got to cut back on public sector support to its economy, but does it have the political will to actually do that? And the answer so far is no.